Um, all right, so uh, as you might guess, I teach Android development at Treehouse. Uh, so Nick kind of gave an overview of what we do. We teach web development, web design, or web development and design, uh, app development, mobile development, um, and business and entrepreneurship. And um, we've got a couple Android projects up right now. Our content is based around uh, it's project-based learning, and the first stage of each project is free. So if you're not a member, uh, I think, were you not a member or somebody? Um, you can come check us out and see if you're interested in, in signing up to work through the rest of the projects. So my name is Ben Jacobin. You can find me on Twitter at bendog24. And, uh, or also, we have a Treehouse Forum. You can look for help there. Um, or also find me at Ben Jacobin on Google+. OK, so I'm going to spend a few minutes going over um, how to get started with Android development, what that means, what you need, um, a little bit about the Android market share and things like that. But I'm also going to step into code uh, a little bit later. Um, hopefully, you guys are interested in that sort of thing, like if you're the kind of audience who likes to get your hands dirty with a little bit of code and trying things. Um, and the reason I want to do that is to show you that once you know where to go, uh, it's not that hard to get started. Take away the mystery, pull back the curtain, and show you, you just set up a, a quick bundle, and you can start coding right away. So it's pretty straightforward. Um, sorry, give me one second to get my place. Oops. I'm sorry, one more time. So yes and no. <laughs> so um, you need to install uh, a bundle of Eclipse, a full IDE, and uh, the Android SDK. But um, <laughs> we do have, we have something called code challenges at Treehouse, where you can get started writing a little bit of code. Uh, it's not a full-fledged development environment, but if you just wanted to get a little bit of taste, you can start with some, and there, there are directed challenges, so it's not free form, but um, yeah, you do have to work through, you have to install the, the programs. Question in the back. Uh, repeating the question? Yeah, good idea. So he was asking, if, is there a web-based uh, code editor? So, all right. Treehouse, we talked about. Um, so real quick question. Um, for everybody in the audience, if you could just raise your hands. Uh, so who has an iPhone, Treehouse members included? Good, good, good. OK, and who has an Android phone? All right. Um, does anybody have uh, either an iOS app, for, for the, whether personally or for their company, or an Android app, personal or company? No, OK. That's why you're here, right? <laughs> um, is anybody currently working on an Android app? Probably not. Good, all right. OK, excellent. He did a Hello World uh, in 2010. That was my next question. Is, do you have any experience at all? If you have a little experience, raise your hand with development, Android. Yeah, and like entry level, um, it's good. Uh, and then medium or a lot, anybody with thorough experience? OK, well, this is the right talk for you then. This is the beginner's guide. So um, if you have any questions, try to save them for the end. But if you think it's timely, if it's important to bring up based on what I'm talking about, feel free to interrupt me. Um, so. Because you're here, I'm going to assume you know the answer to this next question, why develop for Android? Or maybe you don't. Maybe you're just here to learn about Treehouse and absorb all the wonderful information we're trying to share. Um, so in our media, I think we have a bit of an iOS bias, especially in the tech sector of our media. We get a lot of coverage about the latest Apple uh, offerings, apps, etc. But really, um, in both the US and the rest of the world, there's a larger market for Android development. Um, the top graph here is a recent graph from Comscore, and it shows that in the US, uh, Android is the top smartphone operating system with a 53% market share, whereas Apple is still a very strong 36%. Don't get me wrong. Um, but it's just, I think, because of the bias, uh, some people might assume that iOS and Apple have a bigger market share. But really, there's our, there are more Android users to reach. And then when you look at the rest of the world, it's a, an even bigger picture. So th these numbers are from Gartner at the end of the fourth quarter of last year. And Android has nearly a 70% share of the market. Apple is in second place with 21%. Why don't let everybody know the Treehouse skill stage is in the front of 
front of the building right by lunch, the Treehouse Build Stage, uh, as well as the Up Close and Personal Stage. A lot of great stuff going on there. And uh, thank you to John Stock for sponsoring this coffee break. Coffee break. Okay, cool. We got some people walking up. That's great. Walk up, stand in the back, have a seat. This is the beginner's guide to Android, um, in case you hadn't seen the schedule. So we're going to talk about Android. And I was just talking about the worldwide market share. And with these numbers specifically, 70% Android, 20% iOS, that's taking into account the US numbers too. So if you look at the US alone at the top numbers, and then you look at the rest of the world, the discrepancy is actually even bigger with how many people are using the Android operating system. Um, so I just want to kind of reiterate the scope of the Android operating system across the globe. Um, these recent stats from China show that they have now, I, well, this first graph was a projection for the end of February, so I don't know what the actual latest numbers are. But the projection was that by this time, China would now be the leading market for smartphones. This is both, this is both Android and iOS devices by activation in China versus the US. So there's a whole other market out there. If you're thinking you know, outside of the US, outside of the app stores that we know and love, there are a lot of opportunities to you know, make your mark amongst the competition or to find a, a market that doesn't have any competition. You can be the trailblazer in some of these external markets. And you know, again, the, the reason I'm kind of going over this is I think the bias in our media doesn't do a jo good job of um, covering just how much opportunity there is outside of the United States to uh, to use this technology, both Android and iOS. But so it, it, you really just want to make sure you keep your focus broader than just what's close to home. Okay, and if you're just walking up because we're getting more and more people, this is the beginner's guide to Android. So thank you for stopping by. Now that we got that nice announcement. All right, so let's say. After today, you go back to your hotel room and you're like, all right, I want to do it. I'm going to start building an Android app. A uh, good piece of news is it's basically free to get started. All you really need is a computer. Now I know a computer's not going to be free, but I assume that all of you have one. Um, so once you have that, all you need to do is um, download the Android tools. And those include an Android virtual device that you can run on your computer. You can have any kind of Android device on your computer to do your development and testing so you don't need to spend anything for a separate device. Now there is a one-time fee if you want to publish apps on Google Play. It's $25 one time and then you can publish as many apps as you want. So once you get to that point, there is one small out-of-pocket expense. Okay, so in terms of the things that you'll need to install, so besides the computer we just mentioned, uh, the Android tools include an IDE to write your Android code, and then a package of Android tools provided by Google for packaging your app, uploading to the Play Store, managing your assets, things like that. Um, the IDE we use to write Java code for your Android apps, as well as lay out your graphical user interface. The user interface has a drag and drop kind of editor, which we can see on the screenshot here on the left. But you can also edit the user interface in XML code behind the scenes. So it's whatever you're comfortable with. You can do most things within the context of the graphical layout editor. But uh, for some things, you want to get down to the nitty gritty and tweak the actual XML itself. Um, so I'm going to be talking about Eclipse as the IDE for Android. And the reason I do that is because Eclipse is the officially supported IDE from Google. Now, you can use anything you want, really. If you have another IDE that you use to write Java or whatever else, you can write your code. And then you can use the Android tools on the command line to go ahead and package it up and install it on a phone. There are some other IDEs like IntelliJ that also have everything packaged together. IntelliJ, IntelliJ is highly recommended by a lot of experienced Android developers. And it, it really comes down to your personal preference. Depends on what you're comfortable with. The reason I stick with Eclipse, especially um, in a teaching mode, is because that's where all the official resources come from. That's where the latest enhancements to the Android tools come on day one, the preview channels, things like that. So uh, the other reason that I recommend Eclipse, especially for beginners, is because there's a large support community. A lot of people use it. A lot of people have the same issues and have worked through the same issues. So if you get stuck, you've got a lot of places to go for help. You can go to Stack Overflow. You can come to us on Treehouse. You can just search on Google. Go to the Android developer docs. Pardon me. 
I'm going to blame someone else for that. Nick, <laughs> tweeting over there. You're interrupting. Um, so up until recently, to get started with Android development, you had to download and configure a, about five different components manually. And it was kind of a pain in the ass. But um, when we launched our Treehouse Android courses, we wanted to take that pain away from people because we wanted everybody to feel comfortable getting started. So we created a, a bundle, a zip file that you download, unzip, run a quick script, and you're ready to go off the bat. So it was such a good idea and such, such a success that the Android team decided to do the same thing. And uh, now, if you go to the Android developer site, um, okay, so they may have had this in the works beforehand, but um, you go to developer.android.com slash SDK, and you can do the same thing. You download a bundle. It's a zip file. You unzip it. It contains both the Eclipse IDE, all the Android tools. The only thing that's different is you need to set up an Android virtual device on your computer by yourself. It's very straightforward. It's a graphical uh, interface. So it, within Eclipse, you just click on a button, set a few things. We're going to walk through that actually in a few minutes, so it'll take away the mystery of that. So again, it's very easy to get started with this or the Treehouse bundle, whichever you prefer. Have oh, we got a question here in the front row? Definitely. So the question is, has the virtual machine gotten better in 2000 than it was in 2010? And it has grown by leaps and bounds. The Android emulator, it's not just an emulator or a simulator that runs on your computer. It's a full-fledged Android device that runs as its own separate component. And it's a full, uh, ver I think that was, OK. That one I'll take, I'll take the blame for. Um, so. There are two things. One, the, the tools themselves have gotten better. The emulator, um, it runs really fast on, uh, on my Mac, a, a good machine. But there's also some um, additional tweaks you can do to run, um, <laughs> to, to run it uh, at a faster speed with a, on an Intel chip. Um, so if you're not familiar with Android or mobile development or mobile devices, um, they typically have ARM processors, which is a different um, chipset than what's on your computer. But there's a way to use this Intel image that maps you know, a little more efficiently to your computer. And there's some graphic hardware acceleration you can do that uh, makes it a lot more effective. So yeah, it's a lot more comfortable to do now than it was even a couple years ago, even last year. All right, so that was the, the actual things you need to get started. Now, what skills do you need? So Again, if, if you come through Treehouse, and I don't want to do too many of these shameless plugs, but the idea is we want it to be comfortable for anybody with zero skills, zero knowledge about Android to come and get started. So Android apps are typically written in a programming language called Java. And Java is an object-oriented programming language. And if you haven't used it, um, it's a lot like other OO languages like C Sharp or even Ruby, Objective-C, Python. The syntax is a little bit different, but the object-oriented concepts are the same. Um, and as a side note, it's interesting to see on forums when people are asking about getting started with Android, and they see that things are written in Java. And they may be turned off by the Java programming language, because Java has a bad reputation for some good reasons. But the Android, Java within the confines of Android is a lot different than Java of old in like big, complex enterprise systems, or even Java that you may have had to do for like programming assignments in a high school or college class. Um, the Android APIs are pretty straightforward, easy to use. There's a lot of, um, a lot of good documentation, good examples. Um, and the security model is a little bit more secure. Uh, the Java, a common joke about the Java language is the acronym stands for just another vulnerability announcement, because we keep getting all these different um, security vulnerabilities in the Java that we run on our computers. On Android, uh, the whole architecture of the system is configured in this sandbox model where your app runs in its own sandbox. It's not to say that it's you know, totally secure or, or hacker-proof, but it is a more secure model for computing, and you don't have to worry quite as much about the vulnerabilities that you see in the Java that runs on our computers. So you know, having written apps on iOS, Android, across the web, um, it's not really the language that matters. So again, if you're scared off by Java, it's, it, don't let the language get in your way. Um, 
I mentioned before that the user interface is encoded in XML, so it's good to know XML, although, again, there is the graphical interface, so you don't need to know XML. You can drag and drop and just play around, and you can get things, you know, you can get things pretty good with the drag and drop user interface, but the XML is good to know to get in there and fine tweak and really understand how the user interface is designed. So, excuse me one second. <clears throat> Pardon me. So Android also has a separate developer kit called the Android NDK. And it's, it's, that stands for the Native Development Kit. And what that means is instead of just the high-level language of Java, you can write a lower-level language like C or C++. And the reason you might want to do that is uh, two main reasons. One is that you can write your code in C in some kind of library that you can share across platforms. So you might have C code that runs on the computer, on the iOS platform, and on Android. And this way, you can put it on your Android device and interface it with the higher level uh, Java APIs. You can call into the C libraries. Uh, another reason is you can get better performance with a lower level language. So um, for things like gaming, perhaps like a physics engine of a game, you may want the absolute best performance you can. And especially if you've already got that fine-tuned for another application, you may want to pull it in. Now, you can use web technologies like HTML, CSS, and JavaScript. And uh, one way to do that is you can create basically a web app, and you can run it inside of a component called a web view. So the web view takes up the screen on your device, and you can interact with it with touch events, just like a web page. And so you can, use, you can use that knowledge you have already for the web and create an app. The uh, drawback to that is it's not as fast as what we call native applications. Because it's this wrapper around the web, things aren't quite as quick and responsive. There's a, just a little bit of lag. It's not quite as clean. And uh, it, it really just depends on what your users want. Your users might demand a quick and responsive app, or a web app may be sufficient because another benefit of the web app is that you can uh, write it once and then deploy it to all the multiple platforms. So you could have the web app on Android, iOS, Windows Phone, if you care, things like that. So there's pros and cons. Again, it really comes down to what your customers want or what you want to do as a developer or as a team. Um, but it's generally best to go native. Um, now, there are some tools that help you turn your web technology into native code. So one of them is called PhoneGab. One of them is called AppCelerator Titanium. They seem to come out every few months or so, some new variety. And what they let you do is write, uh, write your app in the, the web technology languages, and then it compiles it down behind the scenes to the native code. So there you get the, the benefit of you write it once in your web technology, and then it compiles down to a faster code base behind the scenes. The drawbacks to that are, despite its claim of being uh, cross-platform compatible, there are always quirks going from one platform to the next. So you may write it, get it working perfectly on iOS, and then you may run it through the Android uh, exporter, and you may find that it, you know, some things aren't lined up how you thought, or they don't act exactly the same way. And you may end up spending more time getting it right within the context of the tool than just writing the app on the native platform itself. Um, We'll actually talk more about this on Wednesday. On the still stage, we're going to talk about cross-platform mobile strategy, and we're going to talk about these tools and, and, and web technology and how you might want to use that to leverage your skills across all the different mobile platforms. Another problem um, with any, any third-party tool like that is they generally lag behind the latest Android release. So um, if you know anything about Android, you know that the, the latest version is called Jelly Bean. Before, this was Ice Cream Sandwich. And as each new version comes out every few months or so, um, a new set of features is released. And uh, by nature, any third-party app that takes advantage of that is going to lag behind the newest features. So if you need the newest features in your app, you want to make sure you're using the latest, greatest native technology. Uh, finally, if you really love some other language, such as Ruby, Python, or C Sharp, or others, there are some additional third-party tools you can use to write your code in that language and then also export to Android apps. Um, again, I, you, you can create some good apps with that, uh, with, that um, with those kind of tools, but it's generally best to go native. Um, the other thing I wanted to mention about these is um, once you start trying to write once and deploy everywhere, you start to lose some of the uh, platform-specific um, conventions that your users will expect. 
So you, you want to make sure you balance that as well. Okay, so we've talked about what you need, what things you need on your computer, what skills you need. So once you've got that, how do you actually get started? Well, again, another seamless plug for Treehouse. That's, you can come in with no experience and, and check us out, and, and uh, we'll walk you through and explain step by step how to get started. Um, if you need to skill up a team of developers, um, you can use a site like Treehouse or other online learning and uh, have, have them walk through that. Or it might be helpful to hire a trainer, come on site, and do kind of like a boot camp style setting where you take a team and you all learn uh, on a series of, of projects or something to get up to speed. Now, if you've got a complex app and you don't have the time and you don't have the skills and you need to hire somebody, I just want to point out that it's, it's very important to screen carefully to make sure you're getting somebody who knows how to code for the platform, but not just knows how to code, also knows how to code well. And, and I don't really have any good guidelines on how to find such a person. It's a hard problem in technology in general. But again, taking advantage of the best practices on the platform, the platform-specific conventions, it, there's more to it than just knowing Java, I guess is what I'm trying to say. Uh, and the last thing I want to mention is when you're getting started, uh, if you're going to take an app, um, if, you're, if you're starting on a new app, Check out what's available on the open source landscape, because there are a lot of really helpful libraries out there that can really speed up your development process, especially if you know from the, from the beginning. There's no reason for you to have to reinvent the wheel on how to get some resources from the web if there are 10 libraries on GitHub that do the same thing and do it better than you could ever do. Um, I'm going to talk about this tomorrow. Uh, my talk tomorrow is called Jump Starting Android Development with Open Source Software. So if you're interested in that, check us out tomorrow. So I mentioned the Android developer site. Um, there's no one true way to develop apps, of course, but the developer site has a lot of really good guidelines and general documentation about uh, best practices, about how you should design your apps, how you should program certain parts of it. Um, and the documentation has gotten a lot better. So our gentleman here in the front who's worked with it a couple years ago, the documentation site itself has gotten a lot more clean and organized and thorough, and it's a lot easier to navigate and understand. It still can be a little bit overwhelming when you're getting started because you may not know um, how to navigate the documentation. But um, it's organized along the top with design, development, and reference. And it's easy to uh, just read some of the overviews and, and get up to speed like that. Um, another benefit that I haven't really talked about yet is the ever-expanding uh, group of Android developers. So. Um, the, the pool, the, the support community just keeps growing and growing. There's more and more people answering questions on Stack Overflow, more and more people on Treehouse using Android. So there's a lot more resources online if you get stuck. There's a lot of uh, question and answer uh, forums, places you can post and get some really good help. Okay, so let's, let's take that example again where you're going back tonight after this talk and you want to start programming an Android app. Now, despite what I've told myself in my preparations last week, you're not going to remember everything that we cover right here today. So where do you start? Um, so if you go to the Android developer site, number one, I'd suggest start reading through some of the documentation, just the high-level guides, the design guidelines, and the API guidelines. Because once you do that, you can start to get a picture of what the architecture is like, what tools are available, and things like that. There are also some tutorials to work through. And uh, as well as tutorials on the Android developer site, we've got those free resources available at Treehouse. And if you work through things like that, even if you don't understand everything that you're doing from the beginning, if you just keep practicing and just try and absorb what you can from the experience, it's kind of like muscle memory. Things will start to make sense the more you do it. So you may work through an entire tutorial, not understand fully what you were doing, but when you come back to it and you do a separate tutorial or you do your own project, things will start to click into place. You'll understand more about how the app works, how the life cycle works, things like that. So again, just it can be overwhelming at first, but don't worry about remembering everything. Um, if you just have a task in mind and work toward it, things will start to get into place. So um, again, I, earlier when I was talking about third-party tools, uh, I, I was saying how you need to um, Keep in mind the conventions of the platform. And that's, that's a key point I want to make sure uh, I get across, is remember the platform you're working on. So Android users, and really all users in general, are pretty picky about their apps. And if you take an iOS app and you simply port that design right over to Android, your users might get upset. 
um, and say, well, what's this crap iOS app? <laughs> it doesn't work the way the rest of my Android apps do. So you want to remember certain things about the platform that your users are going to expect. So for example, in the Android phone, you want to make sure that your navigation, your back button, your action bar at the top of your screen work like other Android apps. You don't want to take an iOS navigation architecture and just apply that to Android. Same thing with the web. You don't want to take a website navigation structure and apply it to Android. OK, and then it's not that you can't innovate with your design. It's just that you've got to make an informed decision knowing what the conventions are, what the expectations are, and then go from there. That can be your starting point. So back to like self-learning. So I was talking about working through some tutorials and not really worrying about understanding everything. After that, that's when you really want to pick something that's important to you, some, some kind of task that you want to work on, whether it's something you're interested in or something that you think you may have to use for your work or for your app. But that way, you're driving the learning, and you're going to learn better when you're more invested in it. So um, for myself, when I was first learning, I took a simple, I worked through some tutorials. I got some familiar, familiarity with um, general programming about Android and, and some of the UI widgets I could use and things like that. And then I, um, I wanted to learn a few specific things about getting data from the web, moving it across activities or different screens in the app, and uh, displaying it in a list that I could scroll and touch and tap on the items and have things happen. So what I did is I, I did a, a simple Google search. I set up one screen with a edit text at the top, and that's the kind of field that you can type into. So I captured input from the user. Then I added a button. Again, I added an event to the button so I could search based on that term. Then I sent that data up to Google, got the results back, parsed those results, took that data, brought it over to a second page, <clears throat> and then within that page, it was a list view. I populated the list with the search results, and then on each item, you could tap on the list and take into the browser, send that data, send that URL into the browser and open it up. So the reason that was good for me is I did it piece by piece. I didn't do the whole thing at once. I started with just that first screen. I took the edit text in the button, and I made sure that when the, I could get the data from the user, and then when I tapped the button, that the data was captured successfully. Then I figured out how to go to the web and back and make sure I was getting data successfully. Then once I had that, then I put it into a list and made sure I could set up a list successfully. Then I worried about the touch events of the list and make sure I could navigate to a URL uh, separately. And doing things piece by piece like that, I really got a feel for how everything worked together. I could concentrate on one thing and have a narrow focus, but overall, I was learning about the entire app architecture. So if you can find a little project like that, um, we have some at Treehouse that you can try out that do the same kind of thing, or if you think of something on your own, it's a, it's a great way to really learn and have it stick in your mind. Uh, and the last thing I want to mention is um, if you really like working through a book, uh, one book I recommend is called Professional Android 4 Application Development. It's an awful title, but it's by a really good author named Rato Meyer who works on the Android team for Google. It's very thorough. It covers everything you need to know, and it's got some fun and interesting projects to work through as well. Yeah, the uh, Professional Android Application 4, and um, I've got the links in uh, on the notes for these slides, so after the presentation, I'm going to have a a URL you can write and you can and check it out there as well. So some other helpful resources that I use to stay up to date are Twitter. I follow some people in the Android community. And there's this Android dev hashtag where people will post tips on Android development. So it's a good way to stay up to date, see what the latest announcements are, and things like that. Um, there's a really th strong and thriving Google Plus community, the Android developer community. There are tens of thousands of members. And within that community, there's even a beginner channel. So if you're coming in as a beginner, you can post n uh, new questions for newbies that you, know, you may not want to post on a, a forum of experts, but it's a really open and inviting uh, community. Um, this newsletter, a weekly newsletter called AndroidWeekly.net, um, they cultivate Android resources released throughout the week, blog posts, announcements from the Android team, things like that. So it's a helpful way to, again, stay current with the latest trends and, and topics in Android development. And finally, Treehouse blog, another plug. Um, I'm writing about Android topics specifically. And then we cover, again, all the things that we teach, Android, iOS, and web development design and business. All right, so that's enough for the overview. What I want to do next is take a look at a little bit of code, show you what it takes to set up the development environment, which only takes a minute, create a new project, and then write some simple code. 
So I won't be offended if people slip away while we're looking at code, but again, hopefully, <laughs> hopefully you appreciate. The reason I want to do this is to kind of demystify and take away the, the mystery around what it takes to get started. So I've already downloaded the bundle because I did not want to depend on the uh, Wi-Fi in the auditorium. Um, so I'm going to switch here to Finder. Good. And uh, the bundle from Google comes here in, in a zip file. This is the ADT bundle. ADT stands for Android Development Tools. And if I unzip the bundle, we're going to see those two components that we mentioned on one of the earlier slides. The first is the IDE called Eclipse. And the second is the Android SDK itself, which has all the tools we need to write an Android app. And the SDK is uh, uh, combined in Eclipse is a standalone IDE, but the SDK gets pulled in through this Eclipse plugin called the ADT plugin. So I'm going to, if I click on Eclipse, and start the app. Yeah, I'm going to try and set this up so I can type and talk at the same time. This, this might be dangerous. If smoke starts coming from my ears, please let me know. So application open from the internet. I think I trust it. I haven't had any trouble before. OK, and the first question it asks you is to set up your workspace for Eclipse. This is just where you're going to store your projects by default. I already have one set up. I'm going to say use this by default and click OK. Now, I have some Eclipse settings. You can have multiple versions of Eclipse on your computer, but, and in general, that works fine. But sometimes the settings overlap because there's some shared component behind the scenes. So um, my, my screen may look a little bit different because of that. But I'm just going to close these files that were open. That's for a different project that I had closed. So when you first install, this will be blank. And this should be gone. <laughs> Um, so imagine these aren't here. And we're just going to create a new project, file, new, Android application project. So this is, again, called the ADT plugin. Without the plugin, the Eclipse wouldn't have the Android-specific options. But now they're built in. So here we're going to do the launch test as the project name. The package name is, this is a reverse do domain notation. So um, in Java, the convention when you're writing your own code is to use your organization's name. So I would use com.teamtreehouse that launch test. Now, these fields here about the minimum SDK, target SDK, compile with, et cetera, these allow you to target different versions of Android. So let's say you only want your app to run on the latest and greatest versions. You can set the minimum to Android 4.2. Let's say there's, there are new API features that your app depends on, and it absolutely won't work without it. But you want to reach as, as wide of an audience as you can. So on the Android developer site, they have this dashboard that gets updated every two weeks or so. And it shows what the latest market looks like, the picture of Android devices in use. And the way they get that data is they look at who accesses apps on the Google Play Store. So um, right now, if we go as far back as Android 2.2, codenamed Froyo, that covers basically like 96% of all the Android devices out there in the world. So um, if you just check that dashboard when you're starting a new app, you may want to update these numbers, but we can just take that for now. And we're going to target the latest version, Android 4.2 Jelly Bean. And the theme here, you can pick a, a theme for how your app looks. I'm just going to accept the default Hololite. Click Next. I'll go ahead and create a custom launcher icon. That's the icon that you see on the home screen. And the activity, an activity in Android is the name for the screen or a page. So in the website, you think of a page. In an app, you may think of a screen on a computer. Um, it's called an activity in Android. So I will click Next again. Now here, when you do the icon, you can upload your own asset if you have it, or if you want to create some kind of placeholder. So for here, we'll do just a simple launch fest. Uh, we'll make it centered in a circle and increase the padding. So this is what the icon would now look like on the app home screen. So I will click Next. And this is the activity. This is that little sample of what it's going to look like. As a blank activity, it's just going to have the action bar by, def by default. That gives you the back button and a little bit of extra information. Um, if you click on these other options, there are some templates. And more and more get released with every new version of the tool. But you can see the little screenshot of what they might look like. This is a tablet one that looks good for phones and tablets. So blank activity and click Next. Uh, this is just the name of the activity. And then this is the layout associated with it. So the layout is encoded in XML. 
and you can use, again, the graphical user interface to edit it. We'll take a look at that, um, but this is the name of the layout that will be associated with this activity. So the activity is the Java code that controls the layout. The activity is responsible for drawing the layout and accepting input from the user, whether it's touch events or input from the soft keyboard, anything like that. So if I click Finish, it's going to go ahead and create my project. It appears over here on the left, Launch Test. And it opens up automatically. And on the left here, this is called the Package Explorer. This has all your projects. You can dive, drill down into the project structure itself. On the right is our window for editing the code. And the one that's open by default is the graphical interface for our initial activity. So here you can see I've got multiple activities. Now, this is a little bit squished. But the reason we have multiple activity uh, views on here is you know, one of the complaints about developing for Android is that you need to be concerned with so many different Android devices. And it's a valid complaint. There are thousands of different devices, all with different size screens, different resolutions, different types of hardware that you need to worry about. But you don't need to worry about it every single one in detail. Um, what this preview pane allows, and if I expand it, I might be able to see more. Um, on my screen, it has about 10 different layouts. And it gives me a, just a quick look at how it looks on multiple devices. So I can see how it's going to look on a tablet, how it's going to look on a Nexus device, how it's going to look on an older phone. And that way, when I make changes, I can see in real time, how it, in general, how it's going to look across devices. Uh, you still may need to test across specific devices or specific apps. But um, this is a good way just to help. It's kind of like a sanity check when you're making these kind of design changes. And then at the bottom, we have some helpful windows for problems during the build process. Um, this is where errors will pop up. Uh, some documentation, a console into the Android developer, uh, the Android developer console, and also a console into the, um, the device itself. So if you hook up a phone or if you're running an Android virtual device on your computer, you can see information about it here in this console. Lastly is the log cat, which we're going to write to in a, a few minutes. And the log is a, a window into the Android system log. So each, each phone has a log that you can access. You can have your app write to it. All the apps write to the same log. And using the LogCat tool in Eclipse, you can uh, quickly view the log information. OK, so all I want to do is you can see off the bat, it's a simple Hello World project. The text up here just says Hello World. This is kind of hard to see. So if I right click on it and click Edit Text, then I can change it here down at the bottom. Now, you may be wondering, why does this say at string slash Hello World? And it says resolve value equals Hello World. Android has this concept of string resources. And what they let you do is you define all your strings in one file. It's an XML file, but there's an interface to edit it here. And by doing so, you can define your string in one place and use it throughout your app. But you can also localize your strings so um, you can have different language versions for different regions. So we talked earlier about, about the global scope of Android. If you've got an English version of your strings file, and you've got a Spanish version of your strings file, and a Chinese version, you can have all these different files and then the uh, system will pull in the appropriate file based on the region of the user. So on the, on the user's device, it has their region. So if they download your app in China, they would get your Chinese strings as opposed to your English strings. So it's a really good way to manage uh, your localization across the globe. But you can also type directly here. So if I say, uh, hello, launch festival instead, and click OK, now it's going to show up on our screen. And at this point, our app's basically ready to run. This is a full-fledged app. It doesn't really do anything, but all the architecture is here. Um, quickly, over here on the left, we've got the source directory, which is all of our source code. There's not much in here right now. It's just the one main activity file. Uh, there's a generated directory, which is some code that gets generated for you. Once you build your app, it generates some files and puts them here in your generated directory. There are some Android-specific files. Assets are things like HTML files you might want to include in your project for one reason or another. Binaries, this is where your actual binary executable goes. That's the file that runs the app that you upload to Google Play. Uh, libraries, you can pull in external libraries, like the open source libraries I mentioned earlier. We're going to look at how to do that tomorrow. And then resources are everything that you kind of see and hear in your app. So these first drawable directories are for images and, and viewable resources. And the reason there are so many is to try and give the best possible graphics for each type of device. So you've got high resolution devices, you've got low resolution devices. Ideally, what you'll do is you'll generate an image for every possible res resolution, not every possible, but a, a range of resolutions, put them in these folders, and then the appropriate one gets pulled in based on the user's device. 
Uh, and then down here is the layout file. This is where activity main layout is that we're looking at. Layouts are encoded in XML. And if I switch to the activity main.xml tab, this is the XML code that corresponds to this graphical layout. So overall, the, the big rectangle of the view is called a relative layout. And inside the middle is a text view, this label. And if we click over here, the text view, we can see that the text is what we just typed, Hello Launch Festival. OK, so it's ready to run, but we don't have anything to run it on right now. We need to create an Android virtual device. And that is up here in Eclipse. We've got two different tools. The first is the Android SDK Manager. This is where you go in Eclipse to download the latest release of your Android tools. So whether it's the latest SDK, after Jelly Bean, the rumors are the next release is going to be called Key Lime Pie, Android 4.3 or Android 5, whatever it happens to be. You would come here to the SDK Manager, download the latest, and have it um, go into your SDK folder that was in the bundle that we saw in the Finder window. And, and you know, I forgot to point out earlier, this process is all basically the same on Windows as well. Um, the, your, your bundle is the same. The directory structure is basically the same. Um, and you don't have to do anything special when you're developing the bundle from the Android developer site on Windows. The other tool up here is the Android Virtual Device Manager. And um, I'm going to, well, this, so I've got one created here. This is, again, from my previous installation. But to create a new one, all you do is click on New, and give it a name. I'm going to make this one an older version, just for something different. I'll have it run on an old Nexus. And you can see you can type, you can, you can select all different types of devices, all different types of screens, different types of resolutions. And this gives you a chance to see what it looks like on different types of phones. So let's imagine we have a Nexus S. We're going to target Android 2.2. That's our minimum target that we set when we created our project. You can see the CPU is set to ARM automatically. So we had the question earlier about the emulator. If you select Intel here and you can use an Intel image, you can make your emulator run faster, especially on Windows computers. Uh, I'm going to leave the rest of these alone. But you can see you can actually test the camera. You can test other things. You can test location. You can test movement even. Um, but if I click OK and close this, it'll start automatically when we launch our app. So let me save my changes. You can see I've got unsaved changes. And if I hit Run, I'm going to get an error. And that's because Eclipse can be a little bit picky. And it doesn't like when you hit Run from an XML file. So I imagine this will be fixed in the future. But we can get around this by if you right click on the project and select Run As. We want to run this as an Android application. So now the console will show the steps it's walking through. And we can see that it's creating the emulator for us. And it's, it's going to go through the boot process as if there were a real phone, because this is a full-fledged phone running on your computer. Again, it's not being simulated. That's why it doesn't just spin up automatically. It's got to go through, create the, uh, the like, memory footprint of the phone, and actually boot up the, the Android operating system on this emulator. So it just takes a, a few minutes. Um, and then I, I had some, uh, OK, it's just going to go through another screen here. Um, a couple questions people had asked me on the Treehouse forum about getting started with Android I thought I could throw out here while we're waiting for the emulator to load. This process used to take, I had an old computer where this took 20 minutes to start up. Once it's starting, it's up and running. You don't have to restart it every time. Uh, on a newer computer, it goes a bit faster, though. Um, but one of the questions I got recently at Treehouse was um, like how to navigate the Android developer site. And I've been talking about that a lot. And there's just a lot of information there. And I don't really have a, a helpful answer. Um, but that's why I kept emphasizing, like, take a look at the guides and just kind of get a little level, uh, 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 an idea of how things are organized. Because then you can start to drill into it when you have specific questions or you want to know how things work. All right, so this brings up our app. It's got the launch test title at the top and our string. Okay, And there's some controls here. If you want to go back, we can go back to the home screen. This is what the old home screen used to look like, for example. OK, so I'm just going to make one more change to our code, and that's going to be it. Then we can take some questions. And um, I'll come back here. So now this is the main activity. This is our actual Java code. That was the XML layout that we were looking at. This is the Java code that runs uh, while our app is on the screen. So the activity class that I, I've been talking about, Android has a, a whole rich library of components that we can access. And generally, what we do is we take those components and we customize them by subclassing them. So in this case, we're subclassing the activity class. The activity class takes care of all the, the stuff we need about actually running a, a, a something on the phone and handling input from the user. The activity class has a whole life cycle it goes through. When an app is started, uh, the activity is created, and then it's uh, 
it resumes, it can be paused, it can be destroyed, it can be stopped. So there's a diagram about how the whole life cycle works, but all we care about right, right now is just in the onCreate method. What happens here is the first thing that's called is the onCreate of the superclass. So it goes ahead and it runs all that code that we don't really care about that, that takes care of a, a lot of that stuff behind the scenes for us. Second thing it does is it sets the content view. This is where that XML layout we were working on gets attached to this code. So this activity is the controller for this layout. And they're attached through this call to set content view. OK. So actually, let's go back to the layout. What I'm going to do is I'm going to pull on a button and allow us to tap on it and do something. So over here, this is called the palette. We have all these different controls we can pull on. If I pull it on here and line it up below our text, bloop, and if I spread it out, and here I can right-click again, and I can change things like the text on the button. So if I say edit text, and down here it just says button, I say touch me instead. And if I right-click on it, each element on your screen has an ID associated with it. And that's important because we're going to need to reference this ID in, in the code. So if I click Edit ID, the, the ID is generated as just button one. That's fine. It's, generally, you want to give more meaningful names than that. But um, I'm just going to save this change and go back to the Java. And we're going to create a button variable. Button, name it button. And we're going to set it equal to that element that we defined in the XML. So there's a special method called find view by ID. That's why we need to know the ID. And the ID gets accessed through this generated class called R. R stands for resources. And if we hit ID and hit dot, we get this uh, content assist. We can see that there's the button one ID. So rather than just passing just button one, we always need to reference IDs through the R class. And this, this is the generated section over here that I talked about that we don't really care about at this point. But that's where code, certain resources get generated here that we can access in our code. So um, if you haven't used Java before, you have to import any kind of library that you use, any kind of piece of code. So because we're using a, a new piece called a button, I had to import it. Now this last error here is because the, I don't want to get into too many of the details right here, but the find view by ID method returns a generic view. And a view is a piece, is something on the screen. It's, it's like a rectangular area that draws itself and handles user input. A button is a subclass of a view. The text view that we saw where the, the launch test, launch uh, fest text was, that's uh, also a subclass of a view. So in Java, we do this thing called casting, where we, take, we say, yeah, I know it's a view, but I really know that it's a button. So if we add the button keyword in front and save, now it, it knows that it's going to be a button object. OK, so one more thing we want to do is we need to attach a listener to the button for when it is tapped. So when we tap on it, and, and you might be familiar from this from events-based programming on the web. So we do button.set on click listener. Even though it's technically a tap, we still use the click terminology. And we pass in the actual listener itself. Now we could define a separate list, we could define a separate listener and pass it in here. I'm just going to do it in line. I'm going to type new view.onclick listener. And it's going to drop in a couple lines of code. And basically what it's doing is it's saying that. When our button is tapped, I'm going to call this onClick event. And whatever I put inside this onClick event will run. So if I add, let me add a semicolon here before I forget. And inside here, all I want to do is, is write to the log just to show that we actually clicked something. So I'm going to use the log class. And there are a bunch of different methods available. I'm just going to log some information with i. The first parameter is called a tag. This allows us to sort through. Um, generally, it may be the class name or something relevant. I'm just going to say launch fest. And the second parameter is our message. So I'll say, I've been touched. OK, now the uh, error indicators here are, again, because we're using another Android class called log. Just like we had to import the button class, we need to import the log class. So I hit Command Shift O. And there are two different logs that are available. We want the Android util.log. OK, so if I save these changes and run it again, This will bring up the app again on the same emulator. There we go. You can see our button is there. And if I touch it over here, I said how anytime we access the log, it's available through this tool called LogCat. So now you can hear that LogCat has an event with the timestamp. 
There's our tag, launch fest. You can filter by tags, things like that. Because Logcat can get pretty noisy when you've got a whole device running lots of different apps who are all logging information. And there's our text, I've been touched. All right, so that's the end of the demo portion. Uh, let me just bring up the uh, keynote one more time. Take a quick drink of water. We did it. Thank you for sitting through that. OK. So um, thank you, everybody, for stopping by. This started out really small, and I'm glad some more people trickled by and, and decided to stay. So thank you for listening. Um, all the slides, some uh, links for related readings, some links for resources are all available at this URL down at the bottom. It's, I'm sorry, it's kind of hard to see. It's, it's a treehouse. Dot, a tree, well, treehouse slash launch fest Android. If you uh, scan the QR code with your phone, it'll take you to the website. Um, but if you have any questions for me, uh, you know, if, please stay around and ask me now. Um, otherwise, you can also contact me at bendog24 on Twitter, or again, find me at Treehouse or on Google Plus as Ben Jacobin. <laughs>